So glad to see y'all this morning. Y'all doing well today? Turn to someone next to you and give them a high five. Tell them how good it is to see them. Tell them you sure look good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. You know, I just finished a series. Uh, I guess it was last, first service last week. I finished that series when I promise. I did about 14 parts <laughs> or something like that. Uh, but I promise. So, so this morning, I'm uh, going to begin a new, a new series. Um, and I mentioned it in the end of the first service last week. And I'm going to talk about altars. I'm talking about altars. And uh, I know they're still receiving the offering, so I'll just, I'll just wait a minute. Uh, but first, I just want to just acknowledge last week, we had some great testimonies that, uh, that came in from uh, Richard Roberts. We had a, a message on Monday, uh, Monday or Tuesday, where there was a lady that she was supposed to go in to get a, a heart procedure done, getting a stent put in. And so they went in and they got there and there was no, there was no blockage. So they didn't need to put a stent. So, so we've had, count, you know, a number of, number of testimonies. Amen. Give God praise for that. Amen. Amen. Miracle after miracle. You know, if you don't, don't know already, Heritage of Faith, we believe the Word of God. We believe the Word of God is true. We believe that Jesus is the same yesterday, day, forever. We believe in the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in His return, that He's coming quickly. And um, you either get right or you get left. I mean, that's kind of, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so. <laughs> Anyways, sorry, it's. Kind of, sometimes I can just be blunt, but it's, but I'm so grateful for, for what God has done in my, done in my life. I'm so grateful for what God has done in my life. And, and I'm not saying any of those things as in, in a, in a condemning way or, or anything that it's, it's just knowing that the heart of the father is that we would know him. You know, there's a, um, oh, I'll get in that in a minute. You know, um, it was about six months ago. I was in one of our back buildings, one of our modular buildings, and, and some of them we use for different meetings that we hold, and, and then some of them we have for storage, like Joe's, but it can never have enough storage, right? It's like, uh, so we always seem to run out of storage space, but uh, we were in this one uh, storage, and I was by myself, and I, on the way out of the storage we were at, I looked over, and I, I saw this bench. And, and this bench, and, and I looked over and I, and I saw it, and, and, um, and, I, and I just went over and I sat down on it, and, and, um, and I, you know, I've had an encounters at this bench. Now you say, well, what is that bench? Yeah, usually this bench isn't here, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't look like it really goes with the decor of, of, of you know, where we're at in, in our decorations here, and and so, um, you know, a number of years ago, this was a, a Baptist church, and, and we acquired this church in uh, 1994, the Savelles, Jerry Savelle Ministries, and, and we turned this into this, this place into a Bible school um, way before we ever became a church, and now we have that, that Bible school online through correspondence. And, and so these altar benches were a part of the, the church that was previously here, and, and, you know, we had them on both sides of the, the, uh, the stage before we had remodeled and everything, and, and this is an, an altar bench. And, uh, you know, I remember being in Bible school. I remember even being a part of the church long before I became a pastor and, and coming to this altar and um, having an encounter with God. You know, you may say, Pastor, do, do I have to go to an altar to have an encounter of God? Do I have to go to a piece of furniture to have an encounter with God? And the answer is no. It's not, not about, I believe that this space up here, this altar up here, whether there's a bench up here or a bench not up here, that, that this place, this house, um, this church is a place where people can experience and encounter God. But it's not about the piece of furniture, but... It's about what an altar represents. You know, as I sat there and, and uh, the Holy Spirit just, I could sense God's presence and he, and he spoke to me. He said, he goes, Justin, I want you to pastor and I want you to talk to the church about the importance of altars. You know, there's so many, there's over 400 scriptures that deal with altars within the Bible. Not all of them are, are necessarily good altars. You know, there's some altars that we do need to build, and yet there's altars that we need to burn. There's altars that we need to remember, and there's altars that we need to tear down. 
altars. Altars. You know, what is an altar? An altar is a place where you bring a gift. Altar is a place of sacrifice. Altar is a place of consecration. Altar can be a place where you receive direction. Altar is a place where you can get wisdom for the next seasons of your life. Altar can be a place where you release gratitude and thanksgiving before God. Altars. And so I don't know how long we'll, we'll talk on this, but I, I, I believe there's some important things that I believe the Lord's going to establish in our hearts about altars and the importance of altars. Thank you, Freddie. Give Freddie a hand. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 8. And today I'm going to just lay a foundation. And in different weeks, we'll deal with different topics and, and uh, center around the understanding of what altars are all about. Um, last thing I want you to do is, is to look at a piece of furnishing within a church and look at that's the only place where I can experience God. I, I want you to be able to experience God, but, you know, at, the, at our altar here. But, but it's more importantly for you to understand what an altar is all about. Now, in Genesis chapter 8, there's a, there's a law within teaching. And tonight, I do, this morning, I'm going to do just some teaching just to establish some things. But there's some um, laws of teaching, laws of what they would call the seminary word would be hermeneutics on unpacking scripture and, and talking about, about them. And, and there's something called the law of first mention, or they call it the Genesis effect. And, and what that means is the first time that you see something in scripture, that establishes a precedent. So when you see that use throughout the scripture, it pretty much is going to be centered around the same, the same dynamic. Now, I believe altars were used before Genesis chapter 8. It's just not discussed. I believe God used an altar when, he, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden and he had to sacrifice an animal and clothe it with, with an animal. And I, I believe that Cain and Abel understood something about, about altars. And, 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 and just to, I want you to communicate that. But here, the first time that we see altar used is here in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. And it says this, and Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and he took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and he offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor and the Lord said in his heart, the Lord said something in his heart. So it's something that Noah did that got God to respond At this altar, he brought a sacrifice. I'm, I'm so grateful that we don't have a bunch of bulls and rams and sheep lined up outside for me to like, you know, I'm so, I'm so glad. I, I mean, that we don't have to walk through blood this morning. Aren't you, aren't you glad that we don't have to do that? I, I mean, I'm so grateful that, that we can bring ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. Amen? Amen. And so here, here he brought the, 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 the best of every creature and it said, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any, any more for man's sake. I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. Do you believe God is truth? Yes. The Bible says that God doesn't change. It says that God doesn't lie. And it said that he would no more curse the ground anymore for man's sake. And then it says, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Meaning I, I established, I did do this in Noah's day, but God said, I would no longer do this. There's some different things and teachings that I believe that's really, I think, religious minded and that can kind of a kind of a religious uh, cow, so to speak, in our lives. And 
and there's some different mentalities that thought processes that people have that if God is a good God, how come bad things happen? How many times have you heard that question? How many times have you asked that question? God is good. And after this point here, God is good and does only good. He said, I will no more do this. People say, you know, there's like, well, you know, um, let me make this statement. God does not show up where he's needed. Come on. Preach it. Preach it. Come on. God shows up where he sought. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. That means God can only direct my life when I acknowledge him. And we have a world, we have a society that looks back and get mad at God and offended at God and realizing they haven't given God the place. God does not show where, if God show, another, another statement that, that people can, I believe, not have a full understanding, and it's this phrase, well, God is in control. Well, if he is, he is sure messing things up. Come on. That, I just saw some like religious, like cows just get, <laughs> just get knocked over. No. The thing is, is God can only manifest and show up when we give him permission and we give him place. We have to, Jesus even, you know, Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians. He talks about the God of this world has blinded the minds that believe not. See, when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, what happened is Satan took, took the authority so Adam and Eve totally forfeited the authority over to the earth. And, and, and so, so they had, now Satan had the authority and he became the God of this world. So what we have to understand is, is, is with, with Noah here is he brought to an altar, he brought sacrifices and it caused God to say something in his heart. He, verse 22 says, while, this is God still speaking while the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So what happened? The moment after Noah was at this altar, God brought about something significant. You see, it's what we surrender that God brings about significance. Most of the time we want significance. We want greater things. We want a better life. We, we want to, we, we want to fulfill the purposes that God has established in our heart. But the thing is, is what are we surrendering to? What are we giving ourselves to? Because, because that is going to determine whether you live an extraordinary life or an ordinary life. I don't know about you, but I'm out for extraordinary. But it determines what I surrender to. What altar I choose to build in my life. And some of those things will establish as the, as the weeks go on. But there's some, there's, I have a particular assignment this morning that I want you to see as it pertains to altars. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 40, and you can also turn to Exodus chapter 33. Thank you, Father. Exodus 40, let's look at verse 6. It says, you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Let me read that again. And you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Now, this, this um, burnt offering was where they would bring their sin offerings. This was, the, this was where they would sacrifice the animal and then the high priest would go into the tent of meeting, would go into the tabernacle. Now let's go to verse 26. 
It said he put the golden altar of incense in the tent of meeting before the veil. So you had outside, you had this, this altar of burnt offerings, and that's where they would bring their sin offerings. Then they had this altar of incense, and that's where the high priest would worship God, and they would put incense on these hot, hot coals, and it would, fill the, it would fill the tabernacle with smoke. And at that point, then they could go in behind the veil, and that's where the mercy seat was. Now, I'm, I'm saying that to establish that I want you to understand there was two main aspects of altars that we're dealing with here. One was inside the tent and one was outside the tent. Now, let's look at Exodus 33. And stay with me this, this morning. This, like I said, this is like an introduction to altars. Let's look at verse 7. And the Amplified says, Now Moses used to take his own tent and pitched it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting of God with his own people. And everyone who sought the Lord went out to the temporary tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And when Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people rose and stood, every man at his tent door, and looked after Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the door of the tent, and the Lord would talk with Moses." And all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tent door and all the people rose up and worshiped every man at his tent door. And the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Now think about that. Here we just saw that there was something else outside of the door. It was where there was a, an altar. And here before Moses went to that, he, I believe that he had to put something on that altar. He had to sacrifice. He had to surrender to something. And what happened after that, something significant took place. God spoke to him, Joseph, face to face as a man would speak to his friend. See, a lot of times we're wanting to hear God's voice. We're wanting God's direction. But the thing is, have we put ourselves at the right altar? So here, he's outside the tent, the presence of God shows up, and God speaks to him, and God shares a bunch of things with him, but for the sake of time, let's look at verse 14. And the Lord said, remember, he's talking to Moses face to face, and God speaks to Moses and says, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. A little side note, the word rest actually is Noah's name. Not that means anything, but it sounds good. And Moses said to the Lord, if your presence does not go with me, do not carry us up from here. For by what shall it be known that I and your people have found favor, found favor in your sight? Is it not in your going with us that we are distinguished? I and your people from all the other people upon the face of the earth. Meaning the only thing that makes me different. This is what Moses is saying. The only thing that makes me different is your presence in my life. What makes you distinguished? What's going to make you set apart from anyone else or anything else? It's going to be God's hand on your life, God's presence in your life. There's so many good things here I could keep going with, but let me stay on point here. Verse 16, for by what shall it be known that I and your people have found favor in your sight? Is it not your going with us that we're distinguished? I and your people from all the other people upon the face of the earth... And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing that you have asked, for you have found favor, love and kindness and mercy in my sight, and I know you personally and by name. Wow. Man. And God is no respecter of persons. Does he know you personally and by name? But it's saying, in this, he says, I have found, you have found favor Love and kindness and mercy in my sight. See, it's something amazing that when, when Moses came and brought something to an altar, something significant happened on the other side of it. it was, he, was, he was understanding that, that God's kindness and mercy was in his sight. Verse 18, and Moses said, I beseech you, show me your glory. 
This is such, to me, this is such a statement of surrender. Meaning, this is Moses we're talking about. I mean, Moses already, I mean, got them out of Egypt. And, and here they've seen, the, they saw, a, you know, the, 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 the Red Sea part. They saw all these amazing things. They saw these extraordinary things. And, but yet Moses is saying, show me your glory. Meaning, I need you. I've seen so many things, God, and you've done so many great things through my life. And we saw great victory. You brought me out of the land of Midian. You, you visited me at a burning bush. And, and yet here in this tent of meeting, God is speaking to him and saying, my presence is going to go with you. And he goes, and I'll give you uh, mercy and love and kindness. And, and, and then Moses is still saying, show me your glory. And then what does God say? He goes, I will do this thing that you have asked. And he goes, he goes, now Moses, now you can't see me. He, he goes, now when, when you see me, he goes, I'm gonna put my hand over your face because no one can truly see me and live. But yet when I pass by, you'll see my backside. Hmm. Now let's go over to, actually, I, I, I just bypassed something. Look at verse 19. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, before you, for I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy and love and kindness on whom I will show mercy and love and kindness. What I want you to see this morning and what I'm going to continue to talk about for the rest of our time this morning is that the altar is a place of mercy. The altar is a place of mercy. I'm so grateful that I don't have to approach God in fear. Even when I, I, I was, even when I was selling marijuana, even when I was working at a liquor store, even when I was sitting around with my friends and, and we're passing a joint, passing a, a blunt, I should say, <laughs> Take two and pass. So the, sorry. And <laughs> sorry. If you don't know that, don't worry about that. So, and, and standing there and, and yet knowing I had God's word, that God's word was sown into my heart, that God's word was sown into my life. And, and here I am smoking a blunt with my friends. And, and, I'm, and there's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I, I'm going to be a preacher. <laughs> I said that. I said that. My, my friend, my friend Trevor, my friend Trevor, and he, he looks, he goes, I can see that. So, I mean, it, the thing is, is I'm so grateful that, that there was a time and a moment that, that, that two years after that, two years after that, where I had the start of a respiratory disease. Because I started smoking when I was 12 years of age. I was born with deformed lungs. Uh, my lungs weren't all the way deformed. Had a, had a hole in my heart. Had all sorts of things. I was in John Hopkins 16 months before, you know, I was rushed to the hospital when I was first born. And so here I start smoking at 12, 13 years of age. But yet, even in the midst of that, working at a liquor store, and here I am in my sister's living room, and I cry out, and I'm saying, God, if you're real, I need to know that you're real. Even I could barely say that because I couldn't breathe. And that voice said, he said, Justin, tell me you love me. Tell me you love me. See, my, my choice to make that statement, I love you. And some of you know the story where I stopped and, and then I heard the voice again and I kept saying, I love you. That position to say, I love you, I love you. That was my point of being at an altar. I was in my sister's living room and the presence of God came in. And what did I experience that day? I didn't experience God's judgment on my life because of, of what I was doing or where I've been. I was experiencing God's mercy. Yeah. So we have to understand that the altar and surrendering and sacrificing and bringing your life to the heavenly father is all about receiving his mercy because it's only in his mercy I can truly see the fullness of his goodness. Yeah. Because the next, the next chapter in Exodus 34... God's actually now doing what he just told Moses he was going to do. Verse 5 says, And the Lord descended in a cloud, and he stood with him there 
and he proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, God is merciful and gracious. I believe this was Moses' experience was like at an altar. And what does he, God declared his name, the Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness and truth. Now listen, keeping mercy and loving kindness for thousands. This is my God. Don't let the enemy plant a seed that what you see happening in our world, God has anything to do with. Because this is my God. This was a covenant that was made and we haven't reached a thousand generations since this time. Merciful. Verse 9 says, And he said, If now I have found favor and love and kindness in your sight, O Lord, let the Lord, I pray you, go in the midst of us, even though we are a stiff-necked people. And he says, Pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. Meaning, meaning I, I've got weaknesses. I've got, I, I've got f- faults in my life. But he says, he goes, Pardon those. Forgive those. Take us what for your inheritance. And the Lord said, behold, this is God's response to what Moses just said. And the Lord said, behold, I lay down a fresh term of mutual agreement between Israel and me, a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such have not been wrought or created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among you will see the work. Wow, that is God's mercy. God God said, I'm going to show you marvels. I'm going to show you things that no nation, no other nation has ever seen. But all this came out of spending time, I believe, at an altar. An altar is a place of mercy. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Like I said, I'm so grateful that you all didn't have to bring Pastor Justin, the priest of the service, <laughs> animals this morning. Now I'll take a T-bone. I'll take, I'll take, I'll take, I'll take, I'll take any, yeah, you give me a brisk. Yeah, that'd be great. But, but I'm so grateful that we didn't have to bring sacrifices this morning. <laughs> Verse one. Now, see, when we read this scripture, or I would say when people quote this scripture, most of the time people forget the first part of the scripture. Most of the time people will quote this, Lord, I present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Can you agree with that? If you know the word and you've known the scripture, most of the time that's where, Lord, today as we worship you, I bring myself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable Unto you. Amplified says, which is my spiritual worship. See, when you, when you got out of bed this morning and you chose to show up in this house or you chose to get up and, and, and worship God on, online or whatever avenue you're choosing to, 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 to worship God, understanding that you brought a living sacrifice. You and I are that living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable. And God's not wanting our bulls and our goats. He's wanting our hearts. Yes. He's wanting our hearts. He's not wanting, he, he's not just wanting time. He's not wanting your duty. He's not wanting just your, you know, doing your three scriptures or, or doing the, these quotes and doing that or watching them. No, he's wanting your heart no matter what avenue you're connecting with him. He's wanting your heart. But most of the time, we don't understand the first part. We don't, we, we bypass the first part. And what does it say? I beseech you, therefore, I beseech. This, this isn't just, this is a good idea. No, Paul's saying, you need to understand this. I beg you, I implore you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. I believe it makes more sense in the Amplified. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and I beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as living sacrifices, 
holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service and your spiritual worship. Now think about that. I beg you in view of all the mercies of God. Meaning there's a connection in me presenting my life as a living sacrifice and receiving his mercy. See, his mercy is available. His mercy is always available to each one of us. His mercy is not being kept back from any of us. The only thing that keeps back us from receiving mercy is our ability to surrender to his mercy. So when I submit, when I bring myself, when I bring my hands, my feet, my life, my mouth, my words, my mind, all that I am before God, what happens is now the mercy of God can now work on my behalf. Present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable. So when you come to an altar or you kneel beside your bed or you worship in your car, no matter where you might be, understanding I'm bringing my life before God. And it's when I bring that place of bringing my life before God, he makes something significant out of it. If your life hasn't changed... Since you made Jesus the Lord of your life and you're still thinking and doing what you did when you first got saved, you haven't surrendered. See, people like to make excuses or people like to allowances. But all God's trying to do is I want to take you to a higher level. I want to do something greater in and through your life. Because it's impossible to totally give your life over to God and him not do something significant with it. You know what? I don't smoke blunts anymore. I don't don't talk the way I used to talk. I don't do the things I used to do. You know what? And I don't miss it. I don't care about it. It's not something that I need to, I need to say, well, you know, it's okay to do this. You know, God, you know, it's okay. It's okay to do this. It's okay. If that's where you're at, then you're missing the point. It's not about how much I can do to get away with it. That's not, it, that just lets me know that I haven't got to a place where I'm all in yet. If I'm trying to make excuses for my weaknesses, then I truly don't want to, really, I just haven't surrendered something. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to hell or anything like that. I'm just saying, Paul said this, all things are lawful for me, but not everything's expedient. Meaning because I can do what I want to do, but he said, you know what? It's not profitable. But it's the mercies of God. The mercies of God. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. Now, just as for sake of reference... Back when we were in Exodus 33, or actually Exodus 40, remember there was two altars. There was one outside the tent, and there was one inside the tent. One was for, one was for a sin offering, and then the other was, was for worship. Thank you, Father. Hebrews 13. Let's look at verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Be not carried away with diverse or strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace. That's my prayer for you this morning, that your heart would be established with grace. Not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Meaning that I want your heart to be established by the grace of God, not established through your works. Do you understand? You know, um, you know, I've had different people say different things. Well, you know, well, what day? Well, Someone posted this on, uh, online on Facebook and in the chat while during service. And they wanted to get their point across that, that the true day to worship is on the Sabbath, which is, which is you know, Friday night to Saturday. <laughs> and, and it's just always kind of is interesting to me that people want to have that argument. And I'm like, really? 
really? Colossians said, don't argue about Sabbaths. It said, don't argue about holy days. Don't argue about feasts. Don't argue about what you eat. Don't argue about those things. And, and then I always say, well, Exodus, I mean, Acts chapter, I think 26 or 20 says, says they met on the first day of week. That's Sunday. So the disciples met on the first day of the week. So, I mean, but I'm saying religion gets in and, and it's some sort of works and it's some sort of aspect that all of a sudden I earn some sort of place with God when, when that's not the point. The point is your heart. And anything that our society has issues with, the heart of humanity is sick. Why? Because they don't want to surrender. Thank you, Father. But verse 10 says this. We have an altar. So he's dealing with two different people here. He goes, let your heart be established with grace, not with meat. Therein not profit of them that have been occupied by therein. I mean, you have this whole group of people that are being op- occupied by religion. These rituals. Don't go after that. And then he says, but we have an altar. We have an altar. This is New Testament. We have an altar. Say, we have an altar. Then it says this, we have an altar thereof, they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. Meaning, meaning if all you're doing is still doing things according to the original ritual, then you're missing the point. You can't be at this altar. Verse 11 says, For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Remember, you have the outside the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, outside the gate. So here it says, We have an altar. It talks about they have an altar, but they can't eat of this altar. That's what it's saying. Then it says they sacrifice animals outside, but then it says Jesus was suffered outside the gate. Then verse 13 says, let us go therefore unto him that's without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Meaning this is not my world, but I'm seeking another one, heaven. Then verse 15 says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifices of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So we could actually read it this way. We have an altar. And Jesus was sacrificed outside the city. And by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifices of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. I want you to see this morning that not only is an altar a place of mercy, but I want you to see that Jesus is our altar. When it said we have an altar, the the altar isn't necessarily a a furnishing, although it's, it's about your heart. But I want you to see that Jesus is our altar. And when we come to Jesus, we receive mercy. Jesus is my altar. It, sa- it says we have an altar. And it says it's not like their altar. And it says, it talks that Jesus was, was, was sacrificed, our sin offering outside. And then and it says also by him, by him, through him. Therefore, let us continue to, to give sacrifices of praise with the fruit of our lips. See, it's through Jesus now I can come boldly to the throne of grace and receive mercy for the help in time of need. So when I come to Jesus, what happens is I receive mercy. Go to James. This always comes out different in different services, so. While you're turning there, I'm going to thank you, Father. James chapter 5, I'll get there in a minute. The altar is a place of mercy, and Jesus is our altar. When Jesus 
talking to the Pharisees, and you can make note of this, just really the whole chapter of Matthew chapter 9. And there's some Pharisees that kind of get upset with Jesus, and, and they're talking about different things. And Jesus said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He goes in and he talks about, you know, uh, about, you know, the new wine and old wine, old wine skins and new wine skins. And, and he said, you got to put new wine into new wine skins. Because if you try to put new wine into old wine skins, then it will burst and you'll, lo you'll lose it. What, is Jesus, what does Jesus really mean with that? What he means is, is that you can't receive new revelation with an old mindset. Meaning you, you, you're, you, you see, receive something new and you're going to totally gauge it by, by your past experience or past religious experiences or maybe how the world has, has, has taught you things or how the world has inputted, inputted things into your heart. And you, now you try to measure the world and you try to measure God and try to decide between the two. But that's why you have to approach the word with a new heart to receive new things. But all in this whole concept, Jesus is saying that I want you to receive, I'm more out for mercy than the sacrifice. He goes and he, right before that, he says that, that I've come not for the righteous, but for the sinner. What does that really mean? We, well, he made us righteous. So is that really a bad thing? Jesus' heart was this, meaning Jesus saying, I didn't come for people that didn't need me. See, if you're righteous, you're right. You don't, you don't need anything else, right, Dave? But it says he didn't come for the righteous. He came for the sinner. All that, everything's about sacrifice. Everything's about sacrifice. If you're righteous, then you're not going to really feel like you have a need. Well, I'm good. I'm good. We have to live with a constant requiring him. Right after this, he, as Jesus is talking to John the Baptist's disciples and the, and the Pharisees and, and Jesus makes this point, he says, he goes, he goes right after that, while he was saying these things, Jairus came to him. While he was saying these things. So this is all in co connection with what, what Jesus is saying about mercy, about sacrifice, about, about new wine and old wine and, and all these things. And, and he says, while he spoke these things, Jairus came and worshiped him. He was a ruler of the, he was a ruler. And, and the, think about it here. He brought worship. He brought a sacrifice. And what did he ask? Come and lay your hand on my daughter. And she'll be healed. What happened when he worshipped? Mercy moved. A woman, right at, this all in the same context, right after that, a woman with an, while, they're, while Jesus is on the way to Jairus' house, a woman with an issue of blood stops him in the way and touches the hem of his garment. What was that? She was touching the altar. It was her worship. Why? It, she was sacrificing her life because she didn't belong in public because she had an issue of blood. She was supposed to yell, unclean, 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 so people wouldn't be near her. But yet she pressed through a crowd and touched the hem of her garment. That was her sacrifice. That was her surrender. And what happened? She was made totally whole. Why? Because when you touch the altar, it moves mercy. Same, same, in the same set of scriptures, two blind men cry out. They cry, they said, Jesus. And they, they call him by a covenant name and said, son of David, have mercy on us. So them crying out caused mercy to flow. When you bring about surrender, it will bring, bring forth significant things in your life. Let me close with this in James 5. Mm. Stand to your feet. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. 
You can put your Bibles down. Just want you to have your heart open. You can make note of this or they'll put it up on the screen. The altar. It's a place of mercy. For Moses, he said it's mercy for a thousand generations. And instead that I will make marvels, wonders that nations have yet to see. And here in verse 11, James 5, it says, Behold, we count them happy which endured. You, you've heard of the patience of Job. And you've seen the end of the Lord. How many people know the story of Job? You know, Job was one of the oldest books written. And... And when it starts, the Bible says that he was the richest man in the East. But yet in a matter of, this wasn't his whole life, in a matter of nine months, he lost everything. So what is he referring to? Behold, we count them happy, which endured. And then he compares it. You've heard of the patience of Job and, and have seen the end of the Lord. Meaning you've seen Job and you also saw the outcome of Job. That the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. The Amplified says, you know how we call those blessed who were steadfast, who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and you have seen the Lord's purpose and how he richly blessed him in the end. Insomuch as the Lord is full of pity and compassion and tenderness and mercy. I wrote this down. Let me sure I... Says this, because of mercy, your end will be far greater than your beginning. Because of mercy, your end will be far better than your beginning. It compares it to Job and, and connects Job with mercy. And understanding that it was when Job, the Bible says it was when Job prayed for his friends. Meaning when he submitted to what God wanted him to do, when he surrendered, what happened? Mercy was able to flow. And mercy caused his ending to be far greater than his beginning. Mercy. Lord put it in my heart for uh, Danny and Cassie to sing a song. And I, as they sing this song, I want this song to minister to you. No matter where you might be, I want you to know, let your heart be an altar and receive his mercy today. I know early on, some of you accepted Jesus, received Jesus. Man, what an amazing journey. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus.
wasn't based on what I've done, but His goodness and mercy and the power of the blood. Tell the story and how I've overcome. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Father, we, each one of us, surrender to that mercy today. And as we surrender that mercy today, I thank you as we surrender at the altar, bring ourselves as living sacrifices. It's holy and acceptable to you receive mercy. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for just newness of life, new way of seeing life. Father, with those that hear that 
may have been blinded by all that's happening in our world and the confusion that's so prevalent as we come to you. We receive your mercy. You said if we come to you, you said in no wise would you cast us out. So thank you, Father, for taking maybe our mess and making it a masterpiece. Thank you that Jesus is our altar. And we see the mercy that he's provided. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Just wash over each one of us. Mm. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Oh, we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you that you make all things new. You make all things new. You heal hearts, heal relationships. Thank you, Father. Mm. Thank you, Lord. You don't know what the person came in with, it's on your left and your right. But if you could just place their, your hand on their shoulder and just pray over them and release the mercy of God. Release the love of God that's on the inside of you and release that love on the inside of them. Father, I thank you for ministering your mercy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, that your mercy is in this place, Father. And because your mercy is in this place, I thank you that miracles in this place. I thank you for backs being healed. I thank you for eyes being restored. I thank you for giving hope to the hopeless, joy to the sorrowful, strength to the weak, hope to the disappointed. Strengthen our brothers and our sisters. Strengthen our church family. That as they leave here, they known that you were, they were in your presence. And they cannot deny it, that your presence is in this place. And they've known and experienced the love of God that passes knowledge. And as that is happening, as they leave here today, I declare that they will be filled with all the fullness of God, according to Ephesians chapter 3. Display your mercy through them in amazing ways this week. Thank you, Father, for causing us to see miracles and wonders such as the world around us has not seen. I thank you that this is a year, Father of abundant overflow. I thank you this is a year, hallelujah, for unprecedented, of an outpouring of the glory of God, the goodness of God. Unprecedented, meaning we've never seen something quite like this. I thank you that as we continue to take this journey on altars, Lord, I thank you that we will see, hallelujah, your unprecedented goodness, your unprecedented goodness, being outpour, outpouring of your goodness on our lives. And we thank you for it and we rejoice in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Give him a shout of praise if you received that today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father. Hallelujah. You can be seated.